Hi there. Welcome to the From Lab to Launch podcast by Qualio, where we share inspiring stories from the people on the front lines of life sciences. Tune in and leave inspired to bring your life-saving products to the world. Now let's get started with Robert, Qualio founder and CEO, and our show host. Cindy Dolphin is the CEO and founder of Kelly Medical Drain Carrier. She's also a member of the Academy of Oncology Nurse and Patient Navigators. She likes to challenge the status quo. She is a four-time cancer survivor, and she's been through nine surgeries. Her malady was a catalyst to create a simple yet elegant solution to manage post-op drains and improve upon the 50-year-old conventional protocol which involved attaching drains using safety pins. Cindy enjoys speaking to the medical community as well as to the general public about the importance of patient innovations born from their experience. The insights they gain create solutions which help others with the same medical issues that they suffered. These former patients are determined that others will not have to contend with the problems that they had, and she believes truly in paying it forward. Today, Cindy shares her story, which is one that I think will inspire many out there. Cindy, really excited to have you here today. Thank you so much for, for joining and sharing your story. One of the most exciting parts of my job is getting to support companies like you and, and learn from you know what people are doing to take life-saving products to market and, and do that in a way which makes real you know, positive good on the world. So, so thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for the opportunity to talk about the journey. It's been quite um, interesting. And I encourage others to take this entrepreneurial journey. It seems overwhelming when you start, but it's well worth it in the end. Yeah, I could spend hours asking you questions, but I think the, the big one here is before I dig into your background and, and the journey, could you maybe tell us a little bit about you know, how you're helping people with that uh, Kili medical drain carrier? Um, so this basically came out of my own need. I am a four-time cancer survivor. I've had nine surgeries that required me to have these medical drains after surgery. And it's often used in bariatric surgery, cardiac surgery, and it is usually not explained to the patient that when they come out of their anesthesia, they're probably going to have these octopus-like contraptions that are attached to their body, and then they have to wear them for three to four weeks, sometimes months after the surgery. And they're basically about the size of a hand grenade and they're a bulb that is based on suction principles. So when they're collapsed and capped and attached to a drain line, they siphon away fluids from the surgical area assuring there's no complications or infections. So um, they were invented 50 years ago by a couple of surgeons and they had been very successful over the 50 years. However, the management of those drain bulbs has not improved, and the protocol is to give a patient a safety pin and told to pin the bulb to their clothing or to their house gown or whatever. And um, number one, a safety pin is just not a safe thing to have anytime you're in um, a hospital environment. But two, they're not very safe. And then when it's time to either shower or change clothes, they're, they fail. There's nothing to pin to. So I knew going into my final surgery that I was going to have to deal with these drains. And so I asked permission to bring a Home Depot canvas apron. And they allowed me. And the nurses were just amazed. It was far more useful than pitting the drains to the patient's gown. And uh, they encouraged me. They said this would be something that we would use. And so the only pullback was that when you're showering, you can't wear a canvas apron into the shower. So I came home from that surgery. And this is going to sound goofy, but I went to the dollar store and started buying materials that I thought might create something that would work. And sure enough, these laundry bags that you use uh, in the washing machine, I deconstructed them, reconstructed them, and got them into kind of a, a construction of an apron, similar to the Home Depot apron, and then put long strings on them so they could fit any size. And then I was fortunate enough that UC Davis Medical Center was willing to prototype it for me and try it out with some of their patients. And it came back extremely positive and not only for the patients 
but the nursing teams found it far more efficient for them because you can imagine it takes quite a bit of time to unpin and repin these drains and they have to be emptied three to four times a day. So that's how I came up with it. It was out of my own need and it seems as though it's working and we're now in a number of hospitals and growing all the time. That, that's an incredible uh, story. Must have taken a lot to kind of go through all that and still have the creativity to solve a problem. Uh, do you have a background in this? Is this is this like looking back on your career? Like, are you are you qualified? I guess, or did you? Is this just um, you know you saw the need and you just started noodling on the problem? Yeah, my career was in adult beverages, so it was not even near being in life sciences. Although I can't say there's anything wrong with being adult yeah. beverages, it can maybe help sometimes. But no, this was not my this was not my path. This was not my journey. But I felt that after my last surgery, I chose to step away from a career in corporate life and come up with an answer to help others and the kind of testimonies I get from people on how it really improves their life makes me think I did the absolute right thing. It's not been easy. I really had no idea how to create a company or a business, but I've learned along the way and I've been very fortunate. There have been mentors who guided me. I've had help from things like the uh, Small Business Administration and retired executives and startup community has been really wonderful about gathering around and easing me into this whole new world that I had no idea I was going to enter. We see that a lot actually is that sometimes the right person to solve a problem often needs to come from outside the problem area because you've you don't have any preconceived notions or solutions you come in and you might go well it's these uh, little bags used for long life. why not use something like that I think if you've been in the industry for a couple of decades sometimes you you miss those uh, solutions in front of you. So it's, it's, it's something we've learned. And I'd love to see what you've been doing this now for, for, for a few years, right? How would you describe what you've learned along that path? I think that's for the listeners would be really useful for them to hear. Well, don't assume that your product is going to light the world on fire. <laughs> I did. And I was quite disappointed when I found out that they weren't waiting for me to come up with this invention. And so it took a bit of an emotional toll on myself to find out that I was going to have to work so hard at it. I really thought that it was going to be a product that would be licensed by a much larger medical supply company. And it would be breezy for me, but it wasn't. And there wasn't um, the kind of preparation that I needed from the corporate world. I had been a cog in the corporate corporate world, but never had to develop a PL statement or come up with the infrastructure that was required. So be humble as you enter in, have great expectations that eventually it's going to work, but understand that there's going to be a learning curve for you and for your product. And now I got through most of that, but I'm still learning. Um, I see where I really needed to do quite a bit more research about how to create a launch for a startup than I did. That in healthcare, outside of healthcare, people often think that you know, build it and they will come is often the, the answer of people who have a product that they've built to solve a problem they have. But I think an important lesson there you learned is even when you solve a problem in healthcare, which is incredibly impactful, it's still not all the answer and go to market and how you get things in people's hands is, is important. I'm curious as to, you know, those low points, what made you kind of push through those? I think that's a big part of everyone's kind of entrepreneurial journey. Well, there's still days that yeah. I don't push through and I go back to bed, but um, generally it's because I know I'm making a difference. And I think people in health sciences have that opportunity that you wouldn't in the adult beverage community or in a lot of other um, verticals. This is really a place where you can make a difference in um, healing or treating or anticipating. So that's what keeps me going. I get testimonies from people. I know that people are getting better faster because of our product. And that 
prevents me from getting too low emotionally. I just know that this is going to be used by people. And now we're getting contacted by the actual decision makers, the surgeons, the medical administrators who realize this is a much better way of addressing an issue than just giving safety pins. Yeah, uh, I was doing some, the research we did before this. The, the current state of school is like 50 years old, right? So it feels like it's about time for, for some positive change. And if it took 50 years for, for this to happen, you know, for you to build something that's, that's better than safety pins, which, you know, feels like a, a low bar, but it sounds like you built something that's uh, way up there. Where, where is it going right now? And like, what, what are the trends that you see and, and what should people be thinking about in this area? So I'm glad you asked because I call myself a patient entrepreneur and mm -hmm. I think there needs to be more engagement of patients in solutions to day-to-day -day medical issues. I really think that the patient maybe has the uh, right solution that large corporate or commercial medical suppliers don't even know exist. So in this environment of COVID-19, I hope that we're, in, we're inviting the patient to participate in the development of ways to go forward. So there's just an invaluable resource uh, in learning about the day-to-day -day issues, which aren't the high-tech ones. We need the yeah. high-tech world to come up with the AI, but we don't encourage there to be low-tech answers to some, some issues that happen that really only have simple answers, but we need to engage the patients in the R&D process and make sure that it's called human-centered design, that we're wearing the shoes of the person who's going to be actually using the end product. That's actually important to maybe put a pin on that and just maybe focus on it for a sec. One of the trends we see is that there's a democratization happening. I think in healthcare is like one of the last areas to see this, but bringing in patients, going direct to consumer, uh, all those transversing, I think, are creating an abundance of options for people. So I think it's exciting. And I, I wonder if you look at the industry, what's making what's making it difficult for people to bring in patients? And you know, we call our customers the best free inspiration we'll ever get. In, in healthcare, you have people that are all incredibly enthusiastic about giving feedback and sharing their personal stories. But like, what is it that's stopping people from doing that? Well, I can say that there is some opening doors that are occurring with some healthcare providers. They're actually developing innovation centers that are a part of the hospital complex or campus. And so I'm encouraged that they're seeing the value of the patient in this um, entire innovation process, that we can bring the entire community together to talk about what needs to be developed. And so, yeah, there's probably people who are resisting it. It may be old school medical people, but I think the uh, millennials and younger are seeing that bringing the best minds together, and that might include people who are actually going through a traumatic diagnosis coming yep. to the table and talking about it is going to bring a far better solution than just, you know, eliminating yeah. them or not even talking to them. I think we see that in every case, diversity of thought brings more progress and better products. Uh, but when talking about the hurdles, so we spoke about, you know, finding uh, distributors, uh, being able to work directly with patients and iterate on the product. When it comes to an area we spend a lot of time on is like quality and regulatory compliance, the, the overhead or the burden of companies demonstrating these are safe, they're effective, they work consistently. Did that impact you at all? Is that an area you've had to fight through as well? I'm curious how your, your story intersects with that part of uh, healthcare. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's been um, a major barrier for us to reach as many patients as we could possibly reach because it is not a proven clinical solution. So if we could do some sort of clinical study, it would be far easier for us to get into the healthcare system. But we're really more like, um, I compare it to a sling. If somebody breaks their arm, then it's much nicer if they have a sling to suspend that arm. So there's really not a clinical study that proves that, but it just is common sense that it would make 
more um, and make it much easier for the patients. So, and we don't have the resources to do a clinical study. So yeah, we do face barriers because value analysis committees in hospitals are always looking for a way to prove to the administration that they've got a far better way of doing things. So I think, however, that we're working from the ground up that we have patients who go back to their medical team and say, this helped me. Isn't this something that you should be using on a regular basis with your other patients? So, and, and you know, not having clinical study is difficult, but having patients do the kind of educational process for you is invaluable. Yeah, I think adv- advocacy at, at that level is probably the most important thing. And I'm sure for people listening, it's interesting to note that even a thing like, you know, the, the drainage storage or holding that, that is actually needs clinical proof. And you need to justify ROI with that. And it's one of the big difficulties people often don't think about when looking at healthcare. And I think your story illustrates that a lot. I could dig down incredibly deep on that, but I'm aware we that we don't have all day and I'm not sure everybody wants to hear about digging down into there. So moving on from that, I think a few takeaways from this might be useful for people. And I think you've got some really interesting insight coming into this world the way you have and, and, and in terms of your own direct experience. What are some things you think that those of us in life sciences or people like you or the broader market, what, we, what should we start doing right away? Listening to patients. It really is the key to bring insider knowledge in, um, and, but weigh it. I mean, I know that there has to be science involved with any kind of new innovation. It can't be strictly on somebody's um, concierge desire, but it has, it has its place. And I totally respect the people who are diving deep into the science of developing new medical apparatus, services. But we also have a duty to be sure that the patient is given a chance to be a part of the answer. I have an oncologist that had a great quote. It's equipping the patient with the knowledge that their own creation can improve the medical outcome of others only adds to their own healing process. So it's actually a part of the healing for patients to be consulted, integrated, and and involved with solutions. That's a really fantastic quote. I'll get that from you afterwards and and repeat it to other people. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, so that's something we should start doing. What as an industry should we stop doing uh, right away? Stop looking at high tech as being the solution to every problem. Again, there's things like I have a friend who invented a bed sheet that allows a patient to just be rolled over in order to change the sheet without having to be lifted up. And that is such a small but really critical thing, not only for the patient, but for the nursing teams. I mean, they're, we're seeing as we go through this pandemic that the nursing teams are stretched so thin. And anything that we can do that helps them on their you know, day-to-day interaction with patients is so important so that they can do the work they need to do with the high intense cases that are coming through the doors. So um, not always thinking that there's an app or an AI or a high-tech solution to problems. Let's look at some low-tech solutions for day-to-day issues. It's very, very well said. And if there's magic wand you had and you could wave that and you make one change or improvement, you know, what would that be? It would create, it would be to wave a wand over everyone so that they would desire to lead, to lead a healthy life in order to be proactive so that the kinds of things that come up because we're not mindful of our own health wouldn't be as much of an issue. So preventing diabetes, preventing preventing obesity. So I just wish that there would be a desire in everyone to lead a more healthy lifestyle in order to let the medical world create other things that can address major issues. Fantastic wish. I echo that times 10. Uh, I appreciate you sharing it. I mean, this your story, Cindy, is incredibly inspirational. And where, where could people kind of get more information either on you or, you know, cancer if, if affects one in three people? I think the stats that people share. 
I'm sure there could be some, a lot of interest in, in what you're doing at, at Kelly Medical. How could you get more information? Where uh, We have a website, medicaltraincarrier.com. And then I'm on LinkedIn, so C. Dolphin on LinkedIn. And then we also have an education sheet that's on our website for anybody who's going to have these Jackson Pratt or post-surgical drains. And we encourage people to look at that fact sheet so they can be informed. Many times patients don't even know they're going to have these drains until they're uh, coming out of anesthesia. So we're encouraging the medical community to be proactive and giving the kind of education that a patient will need so they're not surprised when they're um, coming through the recovery process. Andy, thank you for sharing. We'll try and add some of those links to the show notes at the bottom for anybody to kind of go directly to those sources. You're an inspiration. Thank you for joining. I've loved this conversation and uh, I, I know that I'm personally excited to follow your journey and progress. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Robert. I've enjoyed it. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of From Lab to Launch, brought to you by Qualio. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe and give the show a positive review. It really helps us out. For more information about Qualio, our guest today, or to be a guest on a future episode, please refer to the show notes. Until next time.